In southern England, at the border of Oxfordshire and Berkshire, is one of those many British places where the distant past feels very much alive. Strange, old, beautiful, and still revealing new secrets to those who search for them. The Uffington White Horse has been on my mind for many years. Everything about it makes your head spin. Why was it made? Who made it? How old is it? At least that much we know now. It is about 2,000 years older than the other oldest Chalk Hill figure, the Cern Abbas Giant. And like the giant, it can only be appreciated in its full glory from the air. Your best bet if you want to see it from the ground is probably Devizes Road, just down there to the north a bit. If you want to see it from close by, this here is about as good as it gets. Just a few chalk outlines on the ground. But what you can see from here is how fragile it is, how thin those chalk lines are, and you can imagine how quickly it would overgrow if it's not regularly maintained, as it has been for the past 3,000 years. But I always thought it would be extremely unwise to try and make a video about it. It's like Stonehenge, Avebury, Tintagel Castle, Glastonbury Abbey. Thousands of books, articles, TV programmes, YouTube videos have been made about it. As dead horses go, this is a well-flogged one. So, naturally, here I am filming. After all, there is one thing about it that makes it truly unique in the world. It is still there. If such a figure is not regularly scoured and rechalked, it overgrows and vanishes. Depending on where it is, after 10, perhaps 20 years at most. Once it is gone, it is gone. If there is no written record, and in the Dark Ages such things didn't exist, we will never find it again. Ergo, and that is the sensation in my eyes, this white horse has been maintained by the people in the villages here, uninterruptedly, for the past 3,000 years. Cultures have come and gone and the knowledge about who made it and why has been long lost. But we may now finally find out more. Because you see, new stuff has come to light and will continue to come to light within the next few weeks. I'll explain that in a few minutes. Meanwhile, there are many more things to see here. Just up the hill from the horse is Uffington Castle, an Iron Age or perhaps late Bronze Age hill fort, which is amazing. It's a double ditch structure and it seems as if it's not been lived in very much. There are some traces of civilization, but not as much as you would expect if it had been inhabited for several hundred years. It's been reused by the Romans and then out of use shortly after the Roman period. Walking along the wall of the castle here, you can appreciate two things. One, what an impressive structure it is, how much work it must have been to make it. And secondly, that the wind just never stops blowing up here. Down there is Dragon Hill, thought to have been the meeting place of St George and the Dragon. The latter came to a sticky end that day, probably the last of his kind. It is supposed to be a natural hill, although to my eyes it always looked artificial, perhaps a bit like Silbury Hill. But apparently it was put here, or rather shaped, by the glacier that is responsible for all of this rolling landscape, including the giant stairs down there, a bit to the left. Before we come back to the White Horse and what might well turn out to be a sensational discovery, there is one more place we have to go while we are up here, Wayland Smithy. We are walking along the Ridgeway, which is, perhaps a bit unsurprisingly, away along a ridge. In this case, of chalk hills that stretch all the way from Avebury in a northeasterly direction to Ivinghoe Beacon, a distance of some 87 miles. It's been called the M4 of Neolithic times and it's been in use for about 10,000 years as a travel and trade route. Mm -hmm. 
Wayland the Smith is a character of Germanic mythology and as such well known. The earliest written trail we know of are runes on a late 6th century coin found in what is now northwestern Germany. But we can safely assume that the saga is much older. He would have been known to the early English Saxons and so it is no surprise that this place has been named after him when Wessex was still a separate kingdom. A local legend tells us that when a horse had lost a shoe, his rider only had to go here and leave the horse at the smithy and a coin on one of the stones. When he came back a few hours later, he would find the coin gone and his horse newly shod. Wayland Smithy is a Neolithic long barrow from about 3500 BC. It was excavated in two stages in the 1920s and the 1960s and they found that the barrow had been constructed in two stages. First, a few centuries before the final stage, a wooden structure on poles with a few skeletons inside, which is a mound now inside the main mound to the back of myself here. And then a few centuries later followed the Sarsen structure with the big burial chamber we see here. The name Wayland Smithy is at least a thousand years old. It's recorded as Villandus Smithen in an Anglo-Saxon boundary charter of 955 AD. And there we leave Valen Smithy and come back to our main character, the White Horse. Let's have a look at the very few things we know and the things people just have thought up, mostly based on plausibility or imagination rather than evidence. It was once thought to be an image of King Arthur's horse, which means it must have been created in the 5th or 6th century AD. Others said it must have been made to commemorate King Alfred the Great's victory over the Danes, which would make it at least a bit more recent than that great battle, the year 871 AD. In 1995 the age debate was finally settled. Using optically stimulated luminescence dating, as with the CERN Abbas giant, a joint team from Oxford Archaeology and the University of Oxford have determined the time of creation of the horse to be between 1380 and 550 BC, firmly ruling out anything Saxon or even Roman. The people who carved this into the hillside lived some 3000 years ago, late Bronze Age or early Iron Age who they were, and why they spent so much skill and effort on it we do not know. But very soon we might finally find out more. In 2019, during a project to lay water pipes from the Thames to Vantage for the protection of a chalk stream in the valley, Thames Water commissioned Cotswolds Archaeology to check for any historic or prehistoric sites along the proposed route. And they struck gold. In a field in the village of Letcombe Bassett, they found Roman graves, the remains of a Roman villa and, a few hundred metres further, the sensation that many had hoped for. Graves, dwellings and artefacts of people from the late Bronze Age. People who, if not actually having created the figure, most certainly knew who had created it and why. I contacted Cotswold Archaeology. They were very nice, but couldn't say much, because at the time of shooting this, May 2023, a major publication was imminent. It looks as if we might finally get some answers to the questions of who made that horse, and perhaps even why. Meanwhile, I headed over to Letcombe Bassett and met Charles, the person in the village who keeps in contact with the archaeologists and who kindly offered to show me around the excavation sites. Letcombe Bassett is a charming village tucked away in the valley between the Ridgeway in the south and Vantage to the northeast. The Letcombe Brook has its source here, that rare and protected chalk stream. I arrived in Letcombe Bassett a bit earlier than I had planned and walked through this delightful place until it was time to meet up.
Are you still in contact with uh, Paolo of Cotswold Archaeology? Did he get back to you, by the he way? He did. Um, he did, and then he said, as he suspected, he can't say anything. Oh, right. Because they are so close, they are weeks away from publishing something. Yeah. He says it's going to be a book. Yeah. And, uh, and he which thinks is, it's going to be quite, quite revealing, is it? It's, it's, it's definitely a book I'm going to buy the minute it becomes yeah. available. So to fill a book, they must have either found much more or, or analysed it. Yes, I think it's the, in, I, I presume it's the analysis of the research, you know, doing carbon dating, I don't know what else they did, whatever. And they found that it was far more interesting, much richer than they had originally thought. So there was really nothing in between that they found between the Roman and the, the uh, Iron Age. I think perhaps it was slightly more to the right. So going towards that tree, about 40 meters from, from there, was dug out completely with high banks of stuff which they'd taken out. And there you saw the uh, the post holes of where they had the traditional Iron Age uh, dwellings, but there was no wood in the in the hole, but where the the wooden struts went, and uh, and three or four graves open there. I have tried. I've been trying with Paolo to see whether we can get the skeletons back to be buried in the village. Yeah, I've even got a spot for it. But Paolo is very. Uh, you know, these scientists, they don't want stuff that's very interesting to be buried. And the law gives them the, uh, the authority to, to deny it. And that's what they're doing. I would have thought it was a good, morally, the right thing to do, at least the Roman ones, to allow them to be reburied in the village. But... Uh, that doesn't cut any ice. I, I, I could imagine that with those skeletons, uh, it's what they work with. And even if you think they've done everything with them, you could possibly imagine the moment you've buried them again, you realize what it is you had forgotten. Yes, I, I can or, see that. Or you yes. realize what with some new emerging yeah. technology you could now do. Yes. I would say that this is very close to where everything was, this area here. And my theory is that this, this, you know, being in the sort of valley, going down that way, there was either water there as a spring or it was quite close to the surface, so they used that for water. Uh, and that theory is supplemented by the fact that this, for decades, was a pumping station for water. So the, it was a, the water table was close to the surface and this is what attracted them to be here. And of course attracted Thames water 3,000 years later to, to put a pumping station here. You so see this, you see the, the, there's another hump here, these two humps there. You can sort of see this hump just over that. Just behind the tree, yeah. just, uh, yeah behind the, what is it, chestnut tree or... What I love at the White Horse is these, when you're standing at the White Horse and you look down, you see a flat sort of plain on the bottom of the valley. And then you have these beautifully uh, uh, ridged hills yeah, going down. Yeah, what is that called? Is that the giant staircase or something? I don't know, but it's just so beautiful. Um, that actually, I think, is really natural. And, yeah. and if you look at it, I can believe it. It, it seems to be some sort of wave pattern yes. uh, produced in slow motion by the glacier yes. uh, eroding it. I guess, yeah. yeah. Uh, but with the, uh, with the Dragon Hill, I have a hard time to believe that uh, that's, I can't see that's that. not man-made. Yeah, I don't think and so. It looks so much like Silbury Hill if you look at it. Yeah. So this is where you suddenly discovered 2,000 additional years of history of your home village. And up to then, one thought that the fact that uh, Alfred the Great was born at Vantage was about the uh, the oldest known fact we had. Oh yes, yes, 
strangely, I, 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 I always knew that, but um, in an abstract way. Oh, yes, he was born advantage. And yesterday I started thinking, well, where? <laughs> is there any royal palace or so? I didn't find anything. He is. I mean, Alfred was um, Alfred the Great, as they call him, as you probably know, King Alfred the Great, the only king called the Great. Um, he he probably the only king who wasn't a, he was a great king. You know, he revived the monasteries and learning and drove out the. On, there were battles along here, as you probably remember, against the the Vikings. Was it? Oh, yeah. One of the big battles was just on the hill over there. So he drove them out and effectively then established what was England, which didn't exist before. And then England sort of, of course it was taken over by the Normans, but he, it was the start of the, uh, of the, you know, the biggest empire the world has ever known. And now the language that is spoken all around the world. So it's, it, and I think, you know, his, uh, his farm was left to his wife, but as I said, I think his farm was, would have been right there by the spring where we were, and then go all that way along towards Wanted. There is above, I don't know if you saw it, did you see where the little church was? No. No. The church is quite interesting. You've got this small bit on the end, which was built around 11, 1100 very old and then you've got the centuries of building but um, just next to the church is a flat piece of land up up the hill flattened out obviously by humans um, which many people think could have been you know his sort of um, house or whatever palace but it's never been excavated there if you look just above there, there is a, a long plateau just towards the back of the field. Can you see that flat bit along there? It's, it almost looks like a terrace because there's a, there's a very flat bit, very horizontal bit down yes. here, and then it goes up and then there's another one. That's right, right yes, there. yes. I scaled and overlaid a LiDAR image onto an aerial view of that plateau. I think you are absolutely right, Charles. We are looking at centuries-old remains of a large building here. Yeah. So all the other kings in England, anyhow, were murderers, obsessed by power, fear of being dethroned or killed. Tyrants, tyrants of the first order. I mean, they were just a terrible lot. <laughs> in the times before Alfred, that's exactly what happened all the time. Yeah. Uh, if they if they didn't watch their backside, uh, yeah. they were stabbed, uh, literally. This um, this lust for power, but it went on. Of course, Alfred was a, the first king of England, really, and but then you got all sorts of terrible people after that, until they got rid of the power of the king in about 1700. So it took a long time to do that. But of course, the Romans, in their own way, were, were the sort of architects of order and civilization. I mean, they were ruthless in conquering, but when they did conquer a place, they, they looked after it. They improved it in many ways from the uh, sort of barbarians that were there before, such and as here. They usually let people continue practice their religion. Yes. Which probably was a good recipe for stability. Yes, and, and uh, I read that they, they had respected the White Horse, for example. They didn't try to get rid of that. And, uh... But we no longer know what it's for and who made it. We might be getting a bit closer with what they found here. Maybe, yeah. Yes. Um, and, we, and we might be getting even, even closer with, once we know what's in that book. Cotswold Archaeology has been yeah. preparing for four years. It's interesting what you say, that the fact that it was continuously looked after is remarkable because even the, I don't know, the Parthenon or, you know, they just let it go to ruin and, you know, the Greeks didn't bother with it for 2,000 years. Um, but somebody, uh, a group of people... Uh, continuously. Were, yeah, very attentive to making sure. Yeah. So it's a tradition handed down through... Um, what, how many generations? Uh, 
but um, what's more astounding still, these are different people now. Uh, the, 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 the Iron Age, the Stone yes. Age people, they are the ancestors of what we would have called the Britons. Yeah. And they were um, probably really removed by the Saxons and had to all move westwards to what is now Wales and, and, and maybe even Ireland. Yeah. Uh, so the Saxons that settled there are not the same people in terms of ancestry as the, the Stone Age people or the, the, no, the Iron Age no, people were. completely different. But they continue the tradition. Mm -hmm. um, the Romans, the Romans before them, so really, through through different types of the Normans continued as well, because even that is now a thousand years ago. Yeah. It was sort of arguably the Normans didn't replace the Anglo-Saxons; they just they just replaced the ruling class. Yes, and then sort of married into the local people and so on. It's it's very interesting how English evolved from that. It was Frenchified by the by William the Conqueror. But nevertheless, as you know, there are two distinct languages now still in English. One is the Anglo-Saxon, which is for matters of the heart. It's direct. And when the French words are used, it's always to do with the intellect. So if you, if you look at a popular song, it'll all be in Anglo-Saxon. There won't be one uh, French word in it. But if you look at a, uh, yeah. a scientific paper and so on, it's all the French I, words. Of the three questions, when was the horse created, by whom and why, the first one was answered some years ago. With the new discoveries in that field in Letcom Bassett, we are looking, for the first time, at the remains of people who definitely knew who made it, if it wasn't actually themselves, and they knew why. And what a grisly find that was. One skeleton had its head placed below the feet, and the female remains in the round grave had the feet cut off and placed under her arms. These things seem to point to human sacrifices. The forthcoming publication by Cotswold Archaeology will finally bring us closer to answering the who and why question. <laughs>